She was nervous about doing that. And I said, why? What do you have to be nervous about? That was excellent. Nothing in our sick culture has shown the signs of battle and the signs of battle wear more than the family. And particularly the, the first institution given to mankind by God, that of Christian marriage. It should not be a surprise to us that the first institution given to us by God is one of the first things affected by sin. This onslaught has been going on from the very first marriage, and that has never been more evident than it is today. Uh, Hollywood and the media really started a wholesale war on marriage, a mockery of marriage, really back in the 80s by the very public and uh, serial marriages and divorces, uh, and the media's incessant reporting upon it. Today in the media, you will hardly see a married couple portrayed as happy. They won't do it, or better yet, fulfilled in their covenant before God. Since the 60s and the sexual revolution, we've had lots of women leaving the home, entering the workplace, so that many of the conventional roles of husband and wife have been confused and mixed up with the wife oftentimes uh, as much as ever provide, being the provider, as much of a provider as her husband, if not more so. We're told by the media, we're told by music, we're told constantly that personal fulfillment uh, in intimate ways are better found outside the bonds of marriage, and soon the culture doesn't take long before it pretty much follows the leading voices that dominate that sinful culture. Marriage is an interesting institution. Instead of trying to simply eliminate it, uh, the religious covenant of marriage was adopted by most societies. And now those people who 20 years ago in the 90s were mocking marriage as an archaic institution. It's an old ball and chain. It's something you, 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 we are not bound by that old thing. Now they demand it in sin. Now they demand it. All of society has recognized, because it came from God, it's the primary institution, they've recognized the beauty and the necessity of a covenant relationship between one man and one woman. They've recognized the necessity of it for the security of the family. They've recognized the necessity of it for the peace of the children. They have not gotten away from it. They have not gotten away from it. Instead, they have adopted it. Sacred marriage was soon adopted by most of the culture, but the culture, completely unconcerned with the giver of marriage, disregarding his decrees and his original intent with marriage, they started tweaking it and distorting it and bringing in selfish and sinful desires into the marriage. And then they started dissolving those marriages when those desires went unfulfilled. Marriage has gone full circle. It was given by God to man. The culture adopted it. The church, when it was instituted uh, in the new covenant, it was Christian marriage that predominated the culture. And then it went back to the society and the culture. Well, we need to get back to God's design. The cultural view of marriage that is so adopted and predominant today is... Um, uh, that, that predominant view, it's a worldview problem. We really have a worldview problem. So today we're going to look at Mark 10. We're continuing our study there, but really we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So I want you to go there to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm basically preaching Mark 10 from 1 Corinthians 7. It's kind of funny how it works that way, but it does. We were in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and chapter 6. Last week, we're in chapter 7 today, and uh, Corinthians is a book really written for us. you got to understand and know that Corinth was a, the most secular of cities. It was an international city. It was a cosmopolitan city, and it had lots and lots of problems. And needless to say, the church at the time, the church in Corinth, really struggled to make itself different, to really be different 
from the culture, to stand apart, to be sanctified, to be separate, to be special and unique, bearing the image of God. The book of 1 Corinthians was written because Paul heard of some things from Chloe's people. We don't know who Chloe is. We don't know who her people is. But they reported to Paul some concerns that were happening within the Corinthian church. And they asked a couple of questions about Paul seeking guidance um, in an unknown letter. In an unknown letter. So what we see here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is actually Paul's answers to their questions. So what is the question here? Well, let's take a look at it. Let's go and start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 through 6. Let's look at the first six verses. It says, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority of his own body, but his wife does. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come back together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. So what is the question here? What's going on? Well, it's hard to say for certain, but like all churches, the church in Corinth ran the full gamut from those very lax in their faith and those who were very strict in their faith, okay? Basically, there are those who took license in their Christian liberty, and there were those who were still bound up in religious legalism. They, they ran the full gamut, all right? From what we read last week, there were those who were joining their bodies with the temple prostitutes that that were there serving at the, the temple of Athena and Artemis there in Corinth. And then today we see the extreme opposite. It would appear that in a stand against the over-sensualized culture of Corinth, that there were those who were avoiding intimacy even within their own marriage and perhaps even contemplating divorce in an unbiblical pursuit of singleness and celibacy. So we could probably state the question as this. We can imagine the, the, the elders of the church in Corinth writing Paul. And, and they, they asked the question, they said, Paul, is it more holy to be single and, and celibate, even celibate within our marriages? Some seem to think so. Their spouses seem to disagree, probably their husbands, huh? Okay, what say you? This is the question. But before we go to Paul's answer, let us ask why they would be asking that in the first place. I mean, you're asking Paul, a person who was single throughout his ministry, okay? And you're looking at Jesus, who uh, you're, the, you're the church of Jesus Christ, you're, you're Christians, you're little Christ. He never got married in his 33 years, so you can kind of understand where this confusion might be coming from. Is marriage a gift from God? And if so, why did Paul avoid it and why did Christ avoid it? So you can imagine some of the concerns they might have there. And they thought they would go to the source. Kind of a confusing passage of Scripture. Uh, I think it's one where Jesus is using hyperbole. He's using exaggeration for the sake of making a point. But we look to like Luke. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. He says, if anyone comes to me... And does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I think we got a little trouble with hate there. He's not saying you should hate your father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. He's saying your love and your devotion to Christ should be as great or greater, much greater than even your devotion to those people. Even your own life. Even your own life. You got to recognize that first and foremost, your relationship with God is the most important thing. Your pursuit of Christ is the most important thing in your life. Okay? 
So, so that's what he's basically saying. He's saying, look, you got to be willing to possibly even lose those things for the sake of Christ. We see that with the martyrs. We see that in China with the early reign churches. Families have been separated and husbands have been willing to lose their jobs and their ways, their means of providing for their family. Uh, they've been losing jobs. They've been arrested. They've been separated for the cause of Christ. They will not renounce Christ in that situation. Okay? And, and that's what he's saying. Here in Corinth, we're going to get to a passage. We're going to see that there were people that, you know, were, were became Christians. They're, they're married to an unbeliever, an unchristian, an unbeliever, and that person wants to leave. What do you do? Paul's going to answer that in a little bit. He's going to be, he's going to answer that in a little bit. So, you know, what Jesus is saying is that following him, okay, could cost you everything. Are you willing to do it? Are you counting the cost of being a disciple, of following him? Are you counting the, the cost? Paul's answer is pretty simple. He says it's good to be single if you can. He says, but do it only if you can be celibate. And he says, if you can't be celibate, have a spouse. It's a good thing. It's a, the first gift from God. And if you have a spouse, don't deny them intimacy just because the culture distorts it. Just because the culture distorts it. You are married, therefore you are one flesh, Paul is saying. And then finally, if there is one who is married and depriving their spouse of physical intimacy in this first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, stop it. Don't do that. Don't do that. You're going to create more problems for yourself and for them by doing so. You know, he says, if you need time to pray, then agree to it, but make sure the agreement is consensual. And then Paul says, if, if you are totally tempted, if you are tempted by the over-centralized world you live in, if you feel deprived of physical intimacy in your marriage, one, you need to take a cold shower, okay? And then get some self-control and not let Satan have his way with you. Paul finishes there with verse 6. He says, but this I say... By way of concession, not of command. The concession Paul speaks of is this. Uh, there is more to marriage. There is more to marriage than physical intimacy. Okay? But physical intimacy within marriage is not a bad thing. It's a God-given gift. So that gets us to our first point. Okay? Physical intimacy in marriage is a good thing. It's a part of God's gift to you. Okay, physical intimacy in marriage is a good thing. It is a part of God's gift to you. And we all say amen. Okay, here's some warnings. Make sure there is more to your marriage than physical intimacy. Make sure there is a larger spiritual component to your marriage. We're going to look at that in just a little bit. The second warning is, is do not let the world's corrupted view of physical intimacy affect the physical intimacy in your marriage. Okay? They distort it. They, they put it all over every screen they can. Every magazine cover, there is a distorted view, a satanic distortion. You know, Satan takes everything that God has given us good, and he makes a cheap imitation of it. Okay, God gives us the institution of marriage. Our society distorts that. God gives us government, okay, because he is a God of order and a God of authority. Okay, he's a God that, that, that will punish wickedness and reward good. That is God, and he given us, he's given us government for that. Well, it's distorted to where it's oppressive and it's authoritarian and it's abusive. Okay, God's given us the church. Okay, the, the greatest sign of intimacy between him and his people and his son, Jesus Christ. The church is the bride. The son is the bridegroom. He's given us that, and yet there are so many false Christian churches out there. Satan is willfully distorting everything good that God has given us. You've got to be smart enough and in tune with God's design, God's word, God's will to discern the difference. You've got to be doing that. And it's not necessarily pouring into Scripture and studying that helps. It's about being born again and having the Spirit of the living God living within you. Okay? Being able to discern what is good and what is evil. 
Let's keep reading in 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, he says, Paul says, Yet I wish that all men were even as myself, as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them uh, if they remain even as I. What state is that? Even as I. That's unmarried. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But to the married, I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. That's what God's word declares. Again, this is a continuation of Paul's concession. Marriage is more than physical intimacy, and it's more than passion. Okay, It's a willful choice. Love is a willful choice. All right, I hate to quote bad 80s music. It's more than a feeling. You make a choice to love your spouse. I've shown a number of you a, a clip from Vody Bauckham, a guy that went to seminary where I did. He knows Lori a lot better than me because he had to pay all of his Ph.D. bills to her, not me. But anyways, he basically says there, he says, go love your spouse. Well, I don't feel like it. And he says, I didn't tell you to feel like it. He says, the, God's word says, love your wife. So go do it. Well, you know, I don't even want to do that. And he says, great. He says, go love your neighbor as yourself. Your wife is your closest neighbor. Go love her. And he's like, well, I don't even know if that's it. You know, she doesn't even live here. She's not my neighbor. She moved out a couple weeks ago. And he says, great. The Bible says, love your enemy. Go do that. Okay? Love is a choice. It is a decision of the will. There's got to be more to it than just passion and the butterflies. Okay? You know, if all marriages ended when the Twitter patient ended... They'd be short marriages, wouldn't they? Okay? If you are widowed or singled by choice or by divorce and have the ability, the self-control, and even giftedness from God, it would be great if you can stay single for the glory of God. If you do not possess that self-control, especially in an over-sensualized uh, uh, society, Okay, that supposedly is a champion of women's rights, and get, you know they champion those rights by allowing her to kill her unwanted child because of, well, whatever, you know why. Uh, it's pretty insane. We are a society that we supposedly champion women's rights, and we do more to abuse women than ever before. Women are less fulfilled. They have to work harder. Uh, they're, they're treated as a disposable commodity. Uh, we have done more damage to God's gift of women than ever before as all these yahoos, you know, marching in the streets demanding the murder of their babies would ever comprehend. They could ever comprehend that. Okay? So he says, if you do not possess that self-control, it is better to marry or take a spouse than to burn with passion and desire and give opportunity for the flesh and live in fornication. Don't do that. Along those same lines, however, if you are married, do not let your uncontrolled passion or desire uh, to lead you to step outside of your marriage or seek to dissolve your marriage to seek out that passion with someone else. Don't do it. The biblical God-given options for the divorcee are this, reconciliation to your spouse or singleness until one dies. Everything else is a concession. Everything else is a concession. God's perfect design for marriage is one man, one woman for life with no room for divorce. Okay, here's your point here. God's perfect design for marriage is one man, one woman for life with no room for divorce. This is the perfect. This is the ideal. Don't give up on me yet. I know many of you have been affected by divorce and 
have had failed marriages and those things, but listen, hear the beauty of God's original plan. Hear the beauty of it. One man, one woman. Don't distort it. There's no other. Okay? Within marriage, it's a covenant of two imperfect people coming together. It's not that you found the best, and, and because you found the best, you sorted through all the apples, and you found the shiniest, the plumpest, the roundest, the one with no dents or bruises or wormholes or anything, and that's the apple you chose. So I picked the best apple. It's going to be the best. That's not it. It's not what marriage is. Marriage is between two fallen and sinful people, imperfections, blemishes, bumps, and all. Okay? And you get the opportunity, you have the privilege to exemplify Christ in their life, okay, to extend to them great grace and mercy and willful chosen love to them when they are their ugliest. That is the gospel. Marriage is to be a picture of the gospel. Now, I want you to stop and listen here. Listen closely. No daydreaming. I need your undivided attention. Okay, here's the thing. To be married to an imperfect person is to be like Christ is to you. To you. Okay? Don't distort the gospel. The gospel is not Jesus Christ came to save and take to heaven those who are deserving. That would be no gospel at all. Okay? That's not it. Romans chapter 5, 8 through 11 tells us this. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Recognize the beauty, okay, of marriage. Really, all of those institutions that God's given us, he's given us three primary institutions. They are God's institutions, Okay, when the world tries to claim them, when they try and secularize them, when they distort them, it's always an act of Satan. It's always an act of sin. Those three institutions are marriage, family, the church, and government. Okay, you start distorting them from God's design, you end up with the mess that we are in today. The church is distorted, marriage is distorted, the government is, oh, I don't even want to go can't even talk about the government. But here's the thing. Listen to it. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. He's demonstrating his love. We are sinners. Christ died for us. That's the gospel. That's it. But he hates sin. Loathes it. Okay? His wrath has been poured out on sin. All of his wrath will be poured out on all of sin. It's either poured out on his son, Jesus Christ, or it will be poured out upon the one who smugly holds on to their sin and tries to justify their sin, thinking they are justified by doing it. And those who arrogantly call what is right wrong and what is wrong right. There's a lot of people in our society in trouble. A lot of people in our society in trouble. We talk about divorce. God does not hate the divorcee. God hates the sin that caused the divorce. God hates divorce. Okay? God hates what divorce has done to his perfect good gift of marriage. God hates the pain that divorce causes the divorcees. Okay? God hates the pain that divorce causes the children of divorce. It's a distortion of the good gift that he's given us. Let's take a look at Malachi chapter 2 verse 13 through 16. Guys, I'm going to pick on you a little bit here. Verse 13. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Okay? Yet you say, for what reason? Why does God not hear my prayers? Why does God ignore me? 
He says this, because the Lord has been a witness against you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Okay? But not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Okay? Guys, don't be surprised. I'm picking on you a little bit. It shouldn't come as a surprise to you. Notice God says, you have dealt treacherously against the wife of your youth. Again, it does not say you have dealt treacherously against the husband of your youth. In fact, whenever some legalistic, it's usually a man, comes after me and tries to make a perfect marriage, uh, uh, an ordinance, a sacrament necessary for salvation, they always want to take me on on this, and I just slap them around really bad. Okay? I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. All of the Old Testament passages and everything that Jesus Christ himself spoke about the subject of divorce, okay, deal with the husband. Deal with the husband. Mostly because in that culture, the wife did not really have any authority to divorce, but I think it goes a little bit deeper than that, okay? We go to uh, the New Testament, go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 through 32. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason uh, of unchastity, okay, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is known in theological circles as the exception clause, God's design for marriage, one man, one woman for life. Then there's the reality of our sin. There's the reality of our sin, and if there is unfaithfulness, unchastity, okay. Um, there's the exception of divorce. Rare, shouldn't happen. You should try and work that out, but you make her commit adultery if she's divorced from that. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, the so-called exception clause, which Jesus will go on to say, does not exist in God's mind. We're going to look at that in a second. But the point I want to make is that it's the action of men. Okay? It's the action of men uh, who fail, who make her sin. The one who is supposed to be her protector and spiritual guide. Men, this is your job. Provider, protector, spiritual guide by their actions, leads to her sin. Sound familiar? Go back to the Garden of Eden. Adam was the one that received the command not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and eve, uh, evil. Okay? Eve took of the tree. Adam knew it. Adam was supposed to tell her. He was supposed to teach her. He was supposed to protect her. Even if her own desires got the best of her, he was supposed to protect her. He failed. Instead of protecting her and leading her spiritually in a battle against Sin, by his actions or lack of actions, makes her sin. Let's go to our passage that we're really supposed to be looking at today, Mark chapter 10. Let's take a look at that. Mark chapter 10, verse 1 through 12. It says, Getting up, he, that is Christ, went from there to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. Crowds gathered around him again. And according to his custom, he once more began to teach them. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus, testing him, and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. Here's a little preacher insight for you. If somebody ever comes to me and the first thing they ever ask me about is my view on marriage, it's a trap. It's a trap. It always is. Either they're divorced and they want to peg me as un gracious or they're real legalistic and they're blind to the fact that their own marriage is in jeopardy and they think they have the perfect marriage and if I permit it in any way shape or form I must be a, a whatever it's always a trap and, and and so this is the same thing here they came to test Jesus they wanted to trap him that was the goal 
Jesus answered him in verse 3. He answered them and said to them, What did Moses command you? Well, they were proud. They knew the answer. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father, shall leave his mother, and the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two individuals, okay? But they are one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. I close every wedding I do with that. Let no man separate. Verse 10, in the house, the disciples began questioning him about this again, and he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. Okay? That's what the passage there is saying. So there's a lot going on here. Okay? Um, But let's keep moving. For starters... Where is this at? It's in the same region ruled by Herod Antipas. We looked many months back in Mark, uh, earlier chapters of Mark, where John the Baptist was arrested and beheaded for telling Herod that his marriage to his niece and his sister-in-law was unlawful. They hoped Jesus, being uncompromising as he was, they were hoping they would follow suit and they could just go report it to everybody. There were also two, two schools of thought in Jewish culture at the time. There was uh, Rabbi Hillel who said that a man could divorce his wife for any reason, even a burnt dinner. Okay, I just don't like you today. I can divorce you. That was one school of thought. You can imagine that was probably the popular school of thought. The other was uh, Rabbi Shammai who said that there must be some real serious offense there. Of course, Hillel's interpretation was the more popular of the two, so they wanted to paint Jesus as a hardliner in the view of the masses. But omniscient Jesus knew what they were up to, and he just takes them back to Scripture. He takes them back to Scripture. He he, he quotes it there in your Bible. It should be all caps or something like that to show that uh, Scripture is quoting Scripture. Okay, he takes them to Genesis 127. God created them male and male female and he says there in 224 for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh one flesh in God's eyes there is no longer two people but one the husband's first priority becomes his wife it's no longer his mother it's no longer his father it's no longer the family farm And when children come along, it's not the children, wives. It isn't the children. Okay? The best gift you can give your children is a good marriage devoted to one another. That's it. Okay? His priority when he marries isn't himself. It is his wife. Christ, wife, everything else falls in order after that. That's what it comes down to. The Pharisees, not wanting to look foolish in their ignorance of Scripture, bring up Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 through 4, where Moses seemingly permits divorce. Jesus responds to them that this is because of their sinful, selfish, and hardened heart. It wasn't just adultery, because the same law actually said that that, uh, if a wife committed adultery, she could be stoned to death, and the lover too, they could be stoned to death. This was basically... The for any reason, no fault divorce that predominates our culture today. I just don't like them anymore. We just don't feel it anymore. Go back to journey. It's more than a feeling. Three of you know what I'm talking about. Okay. But if you read Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 through 4, it actually reads against the man And for the woman, it protected women from being passed around like a commodity, which is what they are today. They are a commodity. When you use your usefulness, when you use your youthfulness and your beauty, we're off to the next one. 
Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 through 4, this is what it actually says. It says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if that second husband, that latter husband, turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce, let me move on there, okay, and writes her a, a certificate of divorce and sends her, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife, since she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord God has given you as an inheritance. God is essentially saying in this law, if the little boy wasn't man enough to honor his vows the first time, okay, if he would actually let you become someone else's wife, thus causing you to commit adultery, if someone happens that you distort that one flesh image that God has given, if something happens to husband number two, you are protected. You have a certificate of divorce. You do not need to be subjected to the childish, selfish husband, number one, again. In fact, to do so would be an abomination before the Lord. Remember, we're still looking at Mark chapter 10 here. Even the disciples were stunned a little bit by this. There's a parallel passage in Matthew. It tells the exact same thing that we see in Mark chapter 10. And, and they, it adds a little bit. Matthew says a little bit more than Mark. Let's take a look at it. It's in Matthew 19, verse 10 through 12. The disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. You mean I got to be selfish? I got to be sacrificial for my wife? I got to lay down my life for her? I got to lay down my desires for hers? He said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by the violence of men, and there are eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. He was able to accept this. Let him accept it. Let him accept it. Okay, this is high standard, high holiness stuff. Brings us back to what Paul's saying back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you can stay single and pure for the sake of the kingdom of God, great. That is awesome. It is a gift from God uh, for those to whom it has been given. If you can stay single and go be a missionary in, in Tehran, Iran, risking your life and death with no concern for the wife and kids back home, and you can do it with confidence for the glory of God, then do it. It's a gift from God. Your singleness, your celibacy is a gift. It is not of your own. He goes on to say, if you can't do it, do not go on in fornication. Don't live in this perverse society. Get married. Stay married. It is the first command, and the wife is the first gift of God to a man. Cherish her. Cherish her. Adam needed a helper. God saw it. No suitable helper could be found from all of creation. He took a rib flesh of his own flesh, bone of his own flesh. He formed it to a woman and presented it to her. And Adam stood back and goes, whoa, man. Now you know why you're called women. <laughs> Worst joke any pastor could ever tell. <laughs> Here's your point. God has either gifted you with singleness or with marriage. God has gifted you. He's either gifted you with singleness or with marriage. Consider them both seriously. Today, the statistics on marriage, they seem to be getting better, but they're not really. It seems like those, the younger generation, uh, the divorce boom in society was caused by the baby boomers. I just did tons of research on this. Okay? Uh, our great-grandparents, our grandparents, the World War II generation stayed married. They toughed it out. The baby boomers that brought us the sexual revolution of the 60s brought us the divorce epidemic. 
okay? Those that brought us Roe versus Wade, okay? Uh, uh, they, 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 they demanded that moms go back to work and that women can do it and should do everything man can do. Okay, whatever. We're not going to go there. But they brought about the divorce epidem- epidemic. Gen Xers, that's me, okay? The statistics show Gen Xers took ser- marriage a lot more serious, okay? We waited longer. We got married later. That's not the case in my situation, but for the most part, we, we waited longer, and our marriages are lasting, okay? The generation that follows after that is the millennials. The millennials are actually almost, they almost got a perfect score on marriage, okay? Those millennials that get married, for the most part, are still married. One, they haven't quite got to the age where divorce starts kicking in. Two, it sounds good, they've rejected marriage. They live as single people with all the freedom and all that, but they want all the benefits of marriage. They cohabitate. They live together. They share basically a marriage bed together. They do all of those things. They, they want all the benefits and privileges of marriage, but they want the freedom of singleness. This is a great distortion. God has given us either singleness or marriage. No in between. No in between. We've got to consider them both seriously. The problem with the world's view of singleness is that it is completely contrary to Paul's understanding of singleness. The world says divorce, be free, stay unmarried, be selfish, be fulfilled. Everything you do is for you and your own personal pleasure and personal fulfillment. That's the world's view of singleness. Paul says says, stay single and be a slave for Christ. Be a bondservant. The Greek word is doulos. Be a doulos for Christ. Be selfless and be filled with the Spirit of God. And use your singleness to pursue His glory in everything you do. We go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm not there. Hold on a second. Take a look at verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 26. He says, I think then that this is good in view of the present distress. Okay, this is Corinth. Corinth's not that far away from Rome. It's an international city. Corinth was very important to the Roman Empire. Roman persecution was kicking up against the Christians. Okay? So verse 26. I think it is good that in this view of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened. So that from now on, those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it, for the, uh, for the form of this world is passing away. Verse 32. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say to you for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Just quickly brings me to the next point. In marriage or singleness, be devoted to God. In marriage or singleness, be devoted to God. Seek his glory, seek his purpose, seek his will. I know what Paul is saying here. I love, love, love my family. I did not have the gift of singleness. I wanted to get married in the third grade. That's why all the girls ran from me. You're not supposed to bring a ring and carry it in your backpack in the seventh grade. Okay? Nobody told Lori. 
I didn't have that. But there have been times in ministry where a great sacrifice has, has to be made for the sake of the ministry. The ministry needs this sacrifice. My wife and children are going to bear the brunt of it. And I think, man, if I was single, I'd just bring it back, you know, a sleeping bag and sleep on the front pew, and it's good. You know, give me a loaf of bread and some peanut butter. I'll make it happen. My wife and children didn't commit to that. I did. Okay? That's what Paul's talking about there. Let's just stop here. It's been heavy. Let me add a word of comfort here. I realize this is a difficult message for many of you. Many of you are divorced and remarried or even contemplating divorce or even contemplating remarriage. Please understand, it was sin that killed your marriage. It was your own sin. It was your spouse's sin. There was not enough of God's unconditional loving concern for the other. There wasn't enough grace or mercy and forgiveness and willful chosen love being reflected to one another in that marriage. Okay? From this day forward in your current marriage or your future marriage or in your singleness, make sure that you are honoring God wherever you are. Make sure that past sin has been dealt with. Make sure that you are walking by the Spirit and the guidance of the Spirit. And, and I always run into somebody who tries to make divorce the unforgivable sin. It is not. It is not. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, or chapter 7, I'm sorry. It's going to say the wrong thing up here. Verse 9 through 11. It says, If they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that husband should not divorce his wife. Those are the words of Paul, okay? And it goes on to say, go back, let's, I'm, I just, maybe that wasn't an accident. Let me go back to chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Boy, that narrows it down a bunch. Verse 11, look at the hope of the gospel. Such were some of you. You were all of those things. The body of Christ is made up of people who have been forgiven of their fornication, their idolatry, their adultery, okay? Their effeminateness, their, their homosexuality, their, their thievery, okay? Their adultery, all those things. Their covetousness, their drunkenness. The, the, the kingdom of God, the church, is built up. But such were some of you, but you were washed you were sanctified you were justified in the name of the lord jesus christ and in the spirit of god divorce and the adultery of remarriage is not the unforgivable sin in fact you take god's christ's view of adultery I would stand to say every person in this room has committed adultery. If you look at another person with lust in your heart, it's the same as going out and doing that with them. Some were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. If, you were, if you've never experienced divorce, if you are blessed as I am that my parents stay together, even though they were two imperfect people that were at each other's throat sometimes, and, and, and I'm married today because of Lori's great grace. Okay? If, that, if you're one of those people like me, let's get these words to you. Be careful. Don't look down on the divorce. Don't look down on that brokenness. Look at what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 through 2. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual 
Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burden and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. If someone expresses to us that there is trouble in their marriage, is our heart filled with fear and trepidation like it were our own marriage? Do we have any meaningful words of encouragement? When we said we would pray for their marriage, did we? Does it cause us to contemplate our own marriage? Husbands, are you being sacrificially like Christ in your marriage? Wives, are you being willingly submissive to your husbands like the church is to Christ, trusting him? What are the blind spots in your marriage that you are not seeing? Lori and I celebrated 23 years of marriage back in November. I recognize that it is only because of the grace of God, mostly flowing through my wife, that we have made it this far. Statistically, we shouldn't be here as a couple. We were married young, don't ask. We were not established in our careers. We didn't even have a clue what they might be. Okay? We worked side by side with overbearing. Boy, that scared me. Okay. We work side by side with overbearing and intrusive family. Okay? We have mourned the loss of three children. We have struggled to care for a severely disabled child. We've had financial problems for most of our marriage because of those children. We've mourned the loss of two parents. We've had multiple career changes. We've had cross-country moves that were more stressful than adventurous. We've had communication problems to where we can hardly speak to one another. We have both probably wondered if we married the right person. Then we look at the marriage certificate, and I see her name, and she sees mine. Yep, we're married to the right person. According to the world, we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be celebrating 23 years of marriage, but God has gotten us through it. Why? By learning to be Christ to one another. It's more like I'm Christ to her and she's the Holy Spirit to me. When I'm dumb, she is not afraid to convict me of my dumbness. <laughs> and to add insult to injury, she's always right. <laughs> Every time. It's like, oh. Husbands. That nagging wife knows you better than anybody else in the world better than your mama listen to her she's telling you the truth she might not be saying it in the nicest manner but she is telling you the truth okay our marriage as in all of the institutions that god has given us should be a clear reflection of the gospel when there is a trespass is there sufficient grace okay when they deserve All of their clothes out in the front lawn and the door locks changed is their mercy. You're going to keep score and bear a grudge forever, destroying your marriage. Will there be forgiveness? And when they are completely unlikable, will there be willful decision to love them? That is the gospel in marriage. And our marriages should be a reflection of that concerned totally with the other person over ourselves humbling ourselves sacrificially committing ourselves to their good because that's exactly what jesus christ did for you when you were disgusting despicable unlikable other than by his grace and power unsavable god gave it to you he gave you that grace he gave you that mercy he gave you that love Our marriage should be a beautiful, clear reflection and picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, to our neighbors, to our extended families, most importantly to our children, to our children. They should see it. When Lori and I got married, I have no idea who gave it to us. Somebody gave us a plaque. Um, I don't know if we have it hanging right now. We'll find it and hang it up. It says marriage takes three. 
Marriage takes three to be complete. It's not enough for two to meet. They must be united in love by love's creator, our God above. Then their love will be firm and strong, able to last when things go wrong. Boy, when we read that the first time, we didn't know what was coming, did we? Um, Because they felt God's love and know he's always there, he'll never go. And they have both loved him in kind with all the heart and soul and mind. And in that love, they found the way to love each other every day. A marriage that follows our God's plan takes more than a woman, more than a man. It needs a oneness that can, that can be only from Christ. Marriage takes three. And that's a poem by Beth Stuckwish that somebody gave to us. Um, and it's so true. We are to be different in our marriages. I'll say in conclusion, you've probably heard some pastor say it, and you probably read it, that Christian marriages are as susceptible to divorce as the secular world. That is not true. That is a false statement, a false statistic that is put out there. Um, if you take the society at large that considers themselves Christian, it's like 80%, 70%, we're a Christian nation, you hear that, and yet you look at where we're at, it's true. If everybody that identifies as Christian, they go to the hospital, they check in, what are you? I'm a Christian. They write it down. If you take all those people that say they're a Christian, it is true. Statistically, our marriages are no better than everybody else, but there's a really small everybody else. If you take those who actually live out their faith, the truth is like 70% of the country identifies as Christian. Less than 10% are in church in attendance this morning. Less than 10% of the nation, and probably less. They already started their Super Bowl party, okay? We're holy. We wait till after church to start our Super Bowl party, okay? Anybody but the cheaters. Um, statistically, those who actually live out the Christian faith attend church more than they don't, Okay? Attend church more than they don't. Okay, those who, who uh, uh, read scripture and pray actually live out their Christian faith. Our marriage, uh, uh, the divorce rate is 35% less. It's like very nominal. It's very little. And, and, and it's not, we're better than most. If you take all religious faiths, people that are active in all religious faiths, Christian or otherwise, theirs is 20% less. Evangelical, Protestant Christians divorce, active evangelical Protestant Christians divorce much less than the world at large. Why? Because to be truly spirit-filled, to be following Christ, devoted to him, we are to be different. We are to be different in our marriage. So important for us to do so. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we do love you and we praise you. Lord God, sometimes we might foolishly think we married the wrong person. If we went against your word, we might have. If we were a Christian and we married somebody that was not a Christian, we violated your word. But if we're a Christian and we married a Christian... Lord God, that wasn't an accident. All the days of our lives were written before yet there were even one of them. You preordained it. You knew who you gave us to be Christ to. And you knew before the foundations of the world who you gave us to be Christ to us, to be that Holy Spirit, Lord God, to know us intimately, to know all of our flaws and all of our failures, and to help us with committed love to chisel off those rough edges, Lord God. Lord God, we thank you for Christian marriage. Lord God, we thank you for the gifts of our spouses. Lord God, I thank you for the gift of Lori. 
oh man, she has put up with way more than she ever should have. And I am grateful, so grateful. Lord God, we pray for your ministering presence to be on those who are been affected by the pain of divorce. Even children who have been affected by it. Lord, we, we pray for the ministering comforter, that of the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Lord God, help us to recognize our own failures. Help us to lose uh, that seed of bitterness that might still exist in our heart. Help us to forgive and admit our own failure in that first marriage or whatever, Lord God. Lord God, let us seek truly the gospel in our current relationships and where we are going. Lord God, if we need to seek another person's forgiveness, let us seek it. If we need to apologize, let us apologize. Let us be different, Lord God. It's appalling and shocking how many people go after and try and destroy a person they said they once loved. Not sure if there was any love there. Lord God, help us to be different. Help us to be sanctified. Lord God, bring the society back. Be that bond, be that glue that holds our marriage together, Lord God. And let us do that. And let us make you that mortar of our home, Lord God, by putting you first, seeking your will, seeking your desires in everything. Seeking your kingdom first. And then, Lord God, let us choose to love our spouse above everything else in the world. Above career, above children, above possessions. Let us choose to love our spouse. Everything else will fall into place. Lord God, we do love you. We thank you for the picture of marriage the picture of Christ's relationship to the church in marriage, Lord God. We thank you for the gospel of Christ. We ask all of this in his precious and his beautiful name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and sing praises to our Lord and Savior.